how this uh, process of uh, revolution or revolt uh, as the aftermath of the Ar Arabic Spring main, mainly meant the, the occupation of the public space both virtually by using extensively and massively uh, the social networks and the internet and the new technologies, but also, and this is what makes uh, something, the, the whole uh, process very uh, attractive to many, also physically using, occupying the f physically the public spaces uh, with this uh, iconic already moment of Tahrir, but not only many other uh, squares in many other capitals and cities in Arab countries. And uh, this uh, as an expression of, uh, as a materialization, I would say, of, uh, of what is uh, being considered the civil society visibility, but also the, uh, on its part of, uh, of uh, a creativity expression of the mind. No? And this is what we are going to tackle in this panel now. Um, there has been a plethora of artists, filmmakers, uh, musicians uh, producing uh, work um, reflecting what was happening, reflecting uh, the momentum, but also uh, protesting, also uh, um, collecting the wishes, the, the desires, the, the, the thoughts, the ideology of all these movements. And uh, it was very attractive to many at that time, not only within the Arab countries, but also from all of us that were with uh, seeing what was happening absolutely uh, uh, fascinated from outside. And uh, as an outcome of that, many exhibitions, many demonstrations have been organized. Sometimes uh, I have to say that some people have considered a bit of marketing out of that, but this is uh, uh, another, maybe another issue, not uh, the one that we want to focus uh, here today. But the thing is that um, we have to. We, we want to hear uh, what where we are now. No, uh, what has happened, and uh, where, where all this artistic and creative movement has uh, has become. What what has it become, and where all these uh, practitioners of arts and culture uh, are now? Which are their difficulties, and uh, which are their uh, uh, goals when doing uh, their 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 artistic practice? Is in some cases is a private or an individual kind of uh, exercise, but as we uh, learn today, uh, in many other uh, uh, um, uh, cases, is a collective uh, uh, expression. Is like the method, the the, the tool to bring a, a collective uh, uh, um, desire uh, to reality. So. Let's see out of our invitees uh, where we are. We have uh, here three people that will speak to us uh, uh, and will explain to us the cases and the examples from of three very different countries, three countries, countries that have uh, uh, been very much involved on in all this process, but in which the, the, the result or the uh, process have been completely different. We, we will start with the case of Syria and uh, to know more about uh, what has happened and where we are now, we, are, we have here today with us uh, Malu Halasa. Malu is a writer and editor in, in London. Uh, her books include Syria Speaks, uh, which front uh, cover you can see and is the, 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 the lead of the, the performance that we are uh, fortunate to, to, be, to welcome here in Madrid after this session uh, this evening. Um, she's also the author of Transit Tehran, Young Iran and Its Inspirations on the 2009, The Secret Life of Syrian Lingerie, Intimacy and Design on the 2008, Kaveh Golestan, Recording the Truth in Iran in 2007, Transit Beirut, Transit Beirut, New Writing and Images, and Creating Spaces of Freedom, Culture and Defiance in 2002. So as you can see, Malu is a person that has been writing uh, not only uh, uh, after the Arab Springs uh, about uh, uh, public social uh, protest uh, among artists and or among creative minds, but also uh, from before. Uh, Malu, she's herself, she's an art exhibition around her books include uh, the 2012 and, and 2013 Turin exhibition of uprising art from the Syrian resistance, which appeared in Amsterdam, Copenhagen and London and the 2000, 2009 Transit Tehran, Arts and Democracy a documentary from Iran, from the London School of Economics. She's working now on an archive of Syrian uprising art, 
for the British Museum and has recently finished her book novel, Mother of All Pigs. <laughs> no? Yes. Yeah. So welcome, Malu. Thank you very yeah. much. Um, this is from an essay that will be published uh, in the, at, at the end of the summer, and it's called Defying the Killers, the Emergence of the Street and the Culture of Disobedience in Syria. I'll read from this and then I'll show you some images and an excerpt of a very short documentary film. Um, before we, I can say where we are now, I'm going to take you back to 2011. Taken on their own, graffiti, low resolution, resolution pixelated camera work in Arabic slang may not appear to be socially transformative. However, together their impact has had profound implications in Syria, where the cultural revolution, I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. Let's start again. It's called Defying the Killers, the Emergence of the Street and the Culture of Disobedience in Syria. Taken on their own, graffiti, low resolution, pixelated camera work, and Arabic slang may not appear to be socially transformative. However, together their impact has profound implications in Syria, where the cultural revolution that accompanied a broader political uprising is perhaps the only positive development in over four years of brutal conflict. Syrian activists were not operating in a vacuum. For many young Syrians, developments in Egypt and Tunisia were a call to artistic action. In the early months of 2011, a calligrapher in the countryside outside Hama and a fine arts student in Damascus were designing posters and uploading them on the internet for Egyptian and Tunisian activists to carry in their demonstrations. Soon bloody events closer to home prompted Syrians to initiate similar activities for their country. Through the, in oh, okay. Through the internet, with Syrians inside and outside the country, an anonymous poster collective known as Al Shab Al Surya Ref Tarek, the Syrian people know their way, created posters which, dem which demonstrators downloaded from Flickr and other social media sites and carried during the first year of the Syrian marches. Graffiti was another form of the street art that crossed borders quickly. To a large extent, Syrians were influenced by the plethora of overtly political images and statements that appeared in the squares of Tunis and Cairo after January 2011. Egyptian street artist El Tanin would repay the compliment several months later with a stencil showing Bashar al-Assad's head sporting Hitler's distinct hairline and mustache, which spread across social networks. In Syria, graffiti launched the uprising. But it was not the face of a political figure, but a slogan popularized in the heat of nearby revolutions. al Shab, Yurid, Iskat, Al-Nizam, the people want to bring down the regime, was spray painted by 15 schoolboys on a wall in the town of Dara on the 6th of March, 2011. Until this point, Syrians had not yet demanded the overthrow of Assad's family's 40-year-long dictatorship, only for the easing of the emergency law and the granting of greater political freedoms. However, the arrests and subsequent torture of the schoolboys, followed by the shooting of unarmed demonstrators on the streets of Dara, acted as a catalyst for further mass demonstrations. These quickly spread to Homs, Hama, Banyas, and Damascus, and paved the way for a social and artistic activism never before seen in the country. As the artist, cinematographer, and writer Khalil Yunus described it, the revolution within the revolution. By that summer, as attacks and massacres by Shabia regime-controlled thugs continued unabated, Damascus became a canvas for engaged art interventions. In particular, people discovered that the most powerful weapon against a totalitarian dictatorship is ridicule. Activists turned the water in public fountains red. Hundreds of ping pong balls carrying messages of freedom and dignity were released on Mount Kasum, which rolled onto the grounds of Bashar Assad's palace. Near official buildings or heavily patrolled public squares, loudspeakers hidden on rooftops and trash cans or treetops blared out the sounds of protest marches which sent the Syrian muhabarat or secret police scurrying. As one unnamed activist uh, artist explained, because we don't have weapons, this kind of uprising is more intensive than an armed struggle. We want to affect the security forces, make them nervous, but we also want to suggest something smart, interactive, and jokey. 
The spontaneous mass demonstrations that took place in the cities in the country's north were carnivalesque in the Bakhtian sense of challenging authority and allowing trans transgressive ideas to flourish. In the city of Hama, the site of a brutal massacre by Hafez al-Assad, Bashar's father, in 1982, the crowds of thousands singing along to firemen and local singer Kashush, Whittle, Kashush's wittily chanted verse, verses from Yala Eha Ya Bashar, come on Bashar, get out, was cathartic. In homes when the regime checkpoints prevented people from entering the main clock tower square to demonstrate, they constructed their own miniature clock towers and processed around those. Um, you know, I was going to talk more about Crefumble, the cartoons from Crefumble. Also, there's a very interesting collective cartoonet from Darazul, Darazul, who, which was making um, posters from really traffic signs. They wanted to create a, a language, a non-sectarian language of protest. And, but we don't have time for that, so I'll, I'll just continue on. Artistic activity by ordinary people came about, so said the country's best known editorial cartoonist, Ali Farzat, because the barrier of the fear erected and enforced by the dictatorship had been broken. For decades, Farzat published heavily metaphorical editorial cartoons critical of the state in the government operated newspaper, Al Fawa, The Revolution. In 2011, after he shifted from symbolic drawings to produce more explicitly targeted caricatures of Assad, Farzat was attacked by outrage regime supporters and fled to Kuwait. Cartoons and comic strips regularly featured an official Ba'ath Party children's magazine for decades. However, for a new generation of Syrian illustrators, graphic designers, and animators, some with backgrounds in art and advertising or film storyboarding, it was not the country's official cartooning culture or Farzat's coded messages that inspired them. They found modern subversive narratives by reading Japanese manga online in English translation. Like the political posters of the Syrian People Know Their Way Collective, Comic for Serious strips were uploaded on the group's Facebook page for domestic and international consumption. They too documented the main events, themes, and aspirations of the uprising. But the comic strips served an internal and sometimes critical purposes, purpose alongside their obvious, obvious storytelling. When the opposition Free Syrian Army was accused of torturing its prisoners, Comic for Syria produced leaflets distributed by activists, which drew on the humane treatment of prisoners called for in the Quran. For many in the streets of Syria, truth had become stranger than the imagination. Ordinary Syrians started filming events using any recording device at hand, mobile phones, digital cameras, and crap laptops, to address what they saw as the enormous gap between regime propaganda on state-run TV channels and their own day-to-day -day reality. Since 2011, Syria's impressive citizen journalist movement has posted over 300,000 short films and reports on the internet. The scope of the footage broadened as the movement became equipped with phones, with better cameras, and all manner of spy cams through the organi organizing efforts of the nationwide local coordinating committees. Some of it included intimate scenes of torture filmed in claustrophobic settings by spy cameras. Sometimes even more chillingly, the torturers themselves posted the footage as trophy imagery. The rise of the street, because that, that's really what I'm interested in. I'm interested in street culture. Um, because I think for me, street culture is a prism that says more to me about where the country is at and what people, ordinary people, are doing. The rise of the street has also been mirrored in the language emerging from Arab revolutions. Syrian writer and broadcaster Rana Kabani noted the increased use of slang and colloquial Arabic in the postings on Facebook and Twitter. This language entered the chat room and allowed for a larger liberation in terms of who could express themselves. Instead of being forced to rely on modern standard Arabic, the formal language, grammar, and approach of proper public discourse across the Middle East, people were suddenly expressing themselves in the everyday manner in which they spoke and thought. This informality also encouraged the unbridled public airing of once taboo subjects for the first time, sometimes if only for their shock value. Before 2011, 20-something Muslim Syrians used euphemisms to vent their frustrations in public. Derogatory words or sexual slang was not considered polite or acceptable language in a traditional society firmly anchored by family and conservative social mores. Social media provided a platform for more explicit views. Last year, one activist wrote, dick bitch, 
on his Facebook page 20 times and then added, now do I have your attention. 400 people died in Syria today. The internet has always encouraged slang and abbreviated writing in English and other languages. Arabic would be no different. Last year saw the publication of The Smartest Guy on Facebook, status updates from Syria by Abu Said, a former blacksmith who left school when he was in the ninth grade. Described as a Syrian Bukowski, Said found his own free space in the ruptures of his society. His wide-ranging topics include his traditional henna-tattooed henna mother. My mom has never been to Tibet, he's written. She never wore a bikini and doesn't know how to sit on a toilet. Two existential musings. Is there less death on Twitter? Said's flippancy was all the more significant, significant considering his location. Mambij near Aleppo is currently under Islamic State rule. Said's brother was killed by IS, and the family has since fled to Turkey. The ninth child of 15, brothers and sister, Said Skypes his mother every day. In Madrid, for tonight's performance, Syria Abla, he'll be reading from his recently published book in Arabic. Increasingly, art, artists, increasingly, artists critique the Islamic forces as well as the regime. Realism as well as satire appears to be a tall order for IS who beheads, who beheads anyone caught filming. In areas inside Syria where IS holds sway, the barrier of fear, once the preserve of the re regime, has been erected again by the jihadists. Yet Syrians have been innov innovative in the way they challenge authority. Last September, an anonymous woman activist filmed public life in Raqqa with, hidden, with a hidden camera in her niqab. Um, and also, I'm going to show some drawings later on by an American illustrator. Her name is uh, Molly Crabapple. And she's been working. I mean, things are so bad now that, that the way to get this art of resistance out from areas that, um, you know, under IS control is that it's, it's sort of by any means necessary. And Molly has been working with Syrian uh, sources, unnamed sources, that, that have been moving between Raqqa and Mosul. And they've been sending her uh, photographs, of, um, photographs of life in Raqqa. And she's been drawing those, those photographs and trying to give some sense that will, will be co contrary to the slip, slick propaganda that the group has been um, putting out. Um, our book, uh, Syria Speaks Art and Culture from the Frontline, features over 50 Syrian contributors and provides much of the material discussed, that I've discussed now. At a time of continuing violence from the regime, Islamic forces, US airstrikes, and many more, the voices and aspirations of ordinary Syrians obscured by repressive authoritarian rule are finally reaching audiences inside and outside the country. Uh, tonight's readings that we're going to be doing, Syria Abla in Spanish and Arabic, will present musically illustrated stories from the book alongside as yet unpublished work. I, sort of, I feel very strongly that the power of Syria remains in its people, their memories, aspirations, and poignant sense of irony and beauty. The metaphorical street can be anywhere. It has the power to sustain even those who are living in exile. Last year, Syria's best-known novelist, Khalid Khalife, came from Damascus for the book's tour in the UK. At a literary workshop in Bristol, Khalifa stepped outside for a cigarette break, only to be joined by a group of Syrian asylum seekers. By coincidence, they were all from the same rural Kurdish Syrian village surrounded by olive groves where the author had grown up. As they gathered around him, they asked about the trees and the harvest. Um, I don't think I really answered your question about where are th these activists now? What are they doing? Well, some of them are, are, have been busy making work. They're, they're, people, are, people that I know are generally depressed, but they are still working. And this is a, a poster by Al Shab. The, the Syrian People Know Their Way Collective. They're a group of 15. Um, they work together. In, they're, they're inside and outside of Syria. They do everything over the internet. Um, and this is one of their posters uh, that you know, is suggesting that IS and uh, Bashar al-Assad, they're the same enemy. They're not, they're not you know, um, the country's uh, revolution is against IS and al-Assad still. That's what's happening. This was also another one of their posters that I found quite interesting, that they took the, um, the Ba'ath slogan, the Arab nation, um, 
with eternal with its eternal message, and it's it's on it's an Al Nusra f flag that's, that's quite frayed. Um, but so they're doing they're they're still working and they're still they're still producing they're still posting, and um, people are trying to show this work still. Now I have been told that there are uh, clandestine protests still going on in the country. I mean, last year I would hear that there would be 300 every Friday, but the, the numbers have dwindled. I don't know if you're familiar with the work of, I'm sure you're familiar. One of the reasons why I wasn't showing you visuals while I was talking was I kind of feel that people are familiar with the work of Masa Sitmati, who did Top Goon. They've also done a very interesting short documentary called I Love Acting, I'm sure that you've seen it, that takes place in Mambij. It takes place when a cultural festival that they were, go that they were going to participate uh, was canceled because it was shelled by the regime. And uh, I, I spoke to Jamal, uh, the director of Masa Sitmati, um, after he had come back and he was saying, well, you know, the Islamic fronts, they don't like theater. So everyone's being pretty careful in those areas Yeah, they were. They've always been hiding them. Yeah, yeah they're they're, all, anonymous. they're always anonymous. Mm -hmm. They don't really. And when Jamil appears in public, he appears masked in public, mm -hmm. um, which people do. I wanted to show you this uh, poster, which is a, a martyr for bread or bread martyr by the by the Poster Collective, because I found it really interesting that this is one of Molly uh, Crab Apple's um, illustrations from Raqqa. And um, this is also about bread. And Raqqa sits in the bread basket of Syria, and yet families there are finding it hard to have, you know, to get bread. Um, but I find her work pretty interesting because now we've gone to a point, as I said before, that we really need, that Syria is such a dire state that Syrians inside the country, they really can't say that they're doing this. They can't really, and that both the, the activists who are working against Assad and the activists who are working against IS, they're in the middle and they're threatened with death or their families are threatened, so they have to be really, really careful about if people know um, who they are and what they're up to. Um, this was also, I, I found a really interesting illustration because IS had cut off the head of the statue of the, you know, on top of the main clock tower in Al Raqqa. And the clock tower is very symbolic in Syria because it was a clock tower in homes that people would demonstrate around. And as I said earlier, that when people couldn't get there, they would, they would make their own clock towers and process in their own neighborhoods. So it, it has a kind of power these, these, uh, these illustrations, because they're showing us what we're normally not allowed to see. Um, just a couple more, I think. Uh, this is someone walking by advertisements. And these advertisements, you know, the faces are blot out because it's not, yeah, because in, in IS controlled areas, they don't want, uh, it's men's heads that are being not shown because it's a men's fashion uh, company. And then this last one is of uh, children who are, you know, looking for food and garbage. So this, these, these kind of pictures, I think, are very important because we're not, you know, we, we hear about the social media that IS has and what they're doing and how slick they are in their magazines, and we don't really get to see what's on the ground, that it is kind of dire. And it makes you kind of wonder if there would be so many jihadi brides rushing to Syria if they knew they were going to stay in a house and that they weren't going to be allowed out. And you know, just things like that. So it's quite good that, that this material is being shown. Um, I wanted to show you, I don't know how much time I have. Um, maybe we, what we can do. Okay, we'll screen it afterwards. There's a, there's a movie that came out in, in, in just this year that I thought it would be quite interesting for everyone to see. Um, but uh, it's seven minutes, but we can, we'll do it at the end if you like. Yeah, that's fine. 
this is the cover of a literary magazine called Arak. Now, I know that um, Casa Arabe also have a, a, a publication that they publish. But this journal is produced by the Syrian, um, one, the first independent Syrian writers union that has over 400 members um, inside and outside the country. And what's really interesting about they, they, it's edited by uh, uh, Sadak Al Azam, and the deputy editor is Hussam Mohammed, who's the deputy ed at um, Al Quds Al Arabi. And what's really interesting about this magazine is that. They, uh, he's, uh, Hussam told me that they're getting a lot of submissions from all over the Middle East. It's not just Syrians. And one of the things that we've been trying to do with Syria Speaks is that Syria Speaks was published last year and you know, it, it, it documents a particular time. But we've been trying to use the book as a platform for new writing, some of it unpublished writing. Um, so that you know, when we do events, we're always trying to showcase this unpublished or this new writing from Syria. And one of the pieces that we have tonight that's being recited in Arabic is called The Prostitute and the Sniper. And it was written by an activist, um, I don't know if he's in al Raqqa, but he, he draws from, the, uh, from Gilgamesh, and he tells the story of a group of activists in Raqqa that send a, they, they put a prostitute in front of the site of a IS sniper, and kind of what happens. It's quite a jokey piece, but we kind of felt like when we, we, did, we did readings for Syria Speaks in London um, in November, and we really wanted to bring like this new material to the fore. Because the trouble is, is that there are very few places where like new material or this, this cultural resistance or this art of resistance in IS is, I mean, you can find it on the internet. You have to look for it, but you can find it. But it's not really entering into our public space or in our performative places. And so one of the things that we're trying to do with Serious Speaks is really to bring everybody in. Um, so I wanted to show you that. This is the Arabic uh, cover of Syria Speaks that the uh, publisher would not use. But we love it, and I just wanted to show it to you. But um, thank you very much. Thank you, Malu. I'm sorry to, to keep the film uh, retained, but um, we have to be um, strict with the, with the timing. The pity is that there is so much things to see. Uh, we, we need really a full session of uh, dedicated to this topic, yeah. I think. So anyhow, we move now into, into Yemen uh, with Anaï Elbiso. Anaï Elbiso is a person who, ha who knows very well the, 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 this, this, this realm uh, in Yemen. She's been living there for, uh, for a very long time. And she was there during the time uh, of the Arab Spring when, when the revolt started. And she, she, she was able to not only to witness what was happening from the inside, but also to really uh, register it. Uh, it was uh, out of uh, her work as a PhD uh, candidate that she was uh, doing this research and uh, collecting and archiving a lot of material related uh, to uh, initially to artists in in, in Sana in, in, in not on, not only in Sana but in Yemen in Yemen in general, because for many it's quite uh, astonishing to know. But this is the reality. There are artists. There were an, uh, artists uh, in decades before in in Yemen, um, and many of them turn into uh, very active uh, 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 practitioners when the Arab Spring uh, uh, started and the, the revolt and also others, uh, photographers, and simply creative creative minds that were not cons considered themselves as artists became, in a way, artists by uh, using and, and, and producing a lot of materials. So this is what uh, Anai is going to uh, explain to us, uh, just to give you uh, two more uh, details on her biography, which I think it's very important. She's, she's now not living in, in Germany because she, she's uh, attached to the French mission uh, Cefas uh, there, but the, the mission was uh, closed uh, when the uh, revolt happened, so now she's living in Oman. And she's about to, to become a PhD uh, because she will be reading her uh, thesis, doctoral thesis very soon, hopefully. Uh, this uh, before the, the, the summer, uh, uh, a thesis uh, on um, at the um, Sorbonne, Paris 1, Sorbonne and Lausanne uh, University. 
So she has studied uh, archaeology and social sciences, uh, and she has also um, an, a master in Columbia University, New York, and her BA was obtained here in Madrid in Complutense University. So I and I, we are uh, willing to, to, to listen what you have to tell us. Thank you. Okay, so on February 6, 2015, Houthi rebels, a group at war with the government since 2004, formalized their power takeover. A couple of weeks later, Abdul Rabu Mansur Hadi, the current president, escaped house arrest and traveled to Aden, the country's largest city and former capital of what used to be an independent state before the 1990 unification. Currently, there's a provisional government with an official president, Hadi, in Aden, and a non-official one, Mohammed Ali al Houthi, president of the newly proclaimed Revolutionary Committee in Sana'a, what used to be the capital. Since the contentious mobilizations of 2011 that provoked the ousting from power of former President Ali Abdullah Saleh, Yemen has appeared on the news as an scenario of escalating violence where the main actors are the Houthi rebels on the north of the country, the southern movement, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, and demonstrators supporting or rejecting all or some of these groups or claiming different demands from all of them. Little political analysis and interest has been dedicated to explain dispute solving mechanisms, citizens debate, individual or collective initiatives towards conflict resolution, or any other mechanism focusing on what can or, or what can or is being built rather than destroyed. So this is the approach I want to focus on. On January 2015, Murat Subay, a painter in his 20s, together with a group of artists and activists, put up a sculpture in the middle of a commercial street in Sana'a. The sculpture evoked an ancient sim symbol, um, which is called El Muqa, and is related to national unity. Subay wanted to stress Yemeni's expertise at state making with a symbol that reminded that some 3,000 years ago, and I quote him, the tribes in Yemen wanted to make a state and they united their gods, the sun, the moon, and the star, into one god that is El Muqa. Although he fears that the Houthis might prevent him from continuing with his campaign, he still plans to put up more sculptures on the streets in the coming months. Called the Don's Sculpture Campaign, this is the fourth campaign he undertakes in Sana'a, bringing together eclectic participants and putting up art in public places. Now, the street art campaigns, they start in 2012, when following a call placed on Facebook by Subay, an unknown number of people took over the streets to color bullet-marked walls where violent clashes occurred in 2011 between the regime and peaceful demonstrators. So Murad knew very well these demonstrators. He was among the youth that started the sitting in February 2011 what became Change Square, Sahat al Taghair, the epicenter of the revolution in Sana'a, and where he volunteered to monitor the entrances in order to avoid arms into the city. Now, since March 2012 until today, March 2015, he has worked on street art projects that he describes in terms of campaigns. This practice was not completely unprecedented in Yemen, before the revolutionary period of 2011, street art techniques were used in Yemeni cities mainly to reflect uh, religious messages through stencils displaying God is the greatest or there is no God by God or to reproduce political slogans and symbols of political parties. As is the case also in other countries, art was not the first intention of their anonymous performers. However, two cases stand out in the use of techniques associated to street art prior to 2011 because they also integrate and involved painters. The first one took place in 2006 when a group of female painters from the coastal city of Hodeida in the Red Sea chose a wall to paint their first collective piece. 
The second example took place in 2009 in Sana, when several painters participated in making mural paintings that they hung on the walls of the old city, using public space to display solidarity with Palestine at a time when Israel renewed attacks on Gaza. More recently, in 2010 and 2011, tags or signatures appeared in certain walls in Sana. In 2011, these different techniques were being used in the walls nearby Change Square to visually reenact the slogans that were being chanted by the demonstrators. Maybe some of these images might look familiar to you if you were here in an exhibition in 2011. So in many of these images, the word irhal, leave, largely breeding on the walls and the asphalt and street signs, started to appear breeding both in Arabic and in English and using colorful calligraphy. Also, as you see, well, fists were reproduced in colorful compositions, people's silhouette marching in protest and implied references to Facebook were displayed on the walls. Now in 2012, a series of changes occurred. Public space was again being used to express dissent and make social critiques, but this time through painting in a collective manner. Four street art campaigns followed, two in, 2011, in 2012, one in 2013, and another one in 2015. The first one, named Color the Walls of Your Street, was launched on March 2012. Murat first went down to the streets by reproducing his own paintings, previously confined to canvases. They were all accompanied by two pieces of information typically present in pictorial art. The date and the full signature, easily legible, echoing the original canvases. He then put a call on his Facebook page asking people to join him. The campaign was a true success in which not only painters and those responding to the Facebook call participated, but also passers-by joined them as they painted abstract images and colorful compositions that appear next to paintings that also carried social comment. For instance, um, in this one, a child burning in a gun, or um, the word jobless in Arabic announced the political use of artistic expression on public places and showed that art can have also a use as a device to render people aware of social problems. So for this campaign, for Color the Walls of Your Street, Subai conceived a project that was in his understanding a way to distance himself from politics, which he perceived in his words as disgusting. He wanted to beautify his city at a time when power struggles disgust him the most and he chose to do so through painting on walls that could not be politically neutral. As reminders of the death, the revolutionary and pacifist mobilization counted, bullet marked walls were chosen in order to embellish the streets while remembering history still in the making. This project was effectively a project that distanced Subay from institutional and partisan politics, but rooted his practice in the street as a site for enacting social and political critique and as a place of memory of the revolt. It was also carried out using public space without any authorization. Now the brushes and the sprays used on, the, on these paintings were temporarily substituted for a wet paste during the summer of 2012. In this instance, uh, Murat carried out a different project where he pasted photographs taken by his brother, Jamil Subai, who is a photographer. Uh, now the images he enlarged and borrowed were used to show solidarity and to visually enact a social comment. For example, in this one, he portrays a street cleaner, uh, which Murat used to show solidarity with them at a time when they were uh, doing a strike. In this one, there is a man carrying a bouquet of uh, aloe leaves, and it was placed next to the police academy where, um, where a bomb attack claimed by Al-Qaeda Arabian Peninsula had taken place. And next to the photograph, he wrote, aloe to their souls, aloe, yeah, to their souls, with intent to offer, and in his words, presence to the souls of the dead as one offers flowers in a funeral. 
Now this image was used to um, point out when Yemenis give their back to the problems and to what is happening. Following this project, uh, he carried out a new campaign that started in September 2012. Named the Walls Remember Their Faces, it was used to point out a political issue, the forced disappearance since the 1970s until today, <coughs> at least until 2012, of activists, um, journalists, and citizens in general. The government, both in former South Yemen, in former North Yemen, then presided by Saleh, but also the current regime, at least until 2012, are suspected of being responsible for the disappearance of an unknown number of citizens. The stencils included the portrait of the person who disappeared, his name, a line saying, and forced disappearance, and the date it all happened, both in English and in Arabic. His campaign not only served to point out an issue of social concern, but also triggered a larger process of collective memory recovery. Participants to the campaign not only stenciled the images, but they also provided pieces of information about the disappeared citizens or photographs to do new stencils that ended up reaching the hundreds. They commented and exchanged information about their own disappeared family members. They participated in arguments with the military present in the streets. And they became agents in the process of finding more information about the whereabouts of their family members or acquaintances. This campaign was clearly a contentious one, serving to make claims and demands to the authorities and also having several consequences to people outside from the participants. The creation of a special committee to investigate and file cases of enforced disappearance, the discussion over the elaboration of a transitional justice law, and the attention of the human rights minister to promote debate at an institutional level are some of the consequences that followed the stencil campaign. Although this issue was raised several years prior, mainly by a newspaper in 2007, it was a stencil campaign that produced the most important impact by the participation to the recovery of collective memory, but also by including the issue in the political agenda. And the most important part is that it also contributed to finding alive some of the enforced disappeared. This campaign lasted seven months and reach other major cities of the country, namely Ib, Taiz, and Hodeida. Now the third campaign he launched um, took place uh, in July 2013 and lasted for one year. Entitled 12 Hours, this campaign was designed to pass messages of political content. He chose for this project images spray and brush painted, all accompanied by a text written in Arabic and in English. So the campaign unfolds as a series of hours, and uh, each intervention corresponds to one hour. And um, he, he puts also a stencil of, um, of a clock showing the time. So with each hour or intervention, him and also other of the participants direct the attention towards the specific subjects, such as uh, the first hour was uh, arms proliferation, the second hour, our sectarianism. Uh, the third hour was uh, the question of the kidnapping of uh, foreigners. The fourth, the idea of tampering with the nation. The fifth, drone attacks. Poverty. And civil war for the seventh. Then the eighth hour, was dedicated to, um, to paint the portrait of the victims that died at the Ardi Hospital on March 6, 2014, after a terrorist attack claimed by, um, by Al-Qaeda took place. Then the following hours were dedicated to issues uh, such as child recruitment for military actions, the 10th hour, uh, treason to the nation, corruption for the 11th, social marginalization for the, the last hour, and then also for the last hour, the campaign ended on 1st of July with a stencil that reproduced him, Subay, and another painter that participated in the list of all the, um, the hours, 
and we read writing, we want to be silenced. After he finished this campaign, he traveled to Italy in November 2014 to receive the R4 Peace Award from the Veronese Foundation. He then returned to Yemen and used the money he received to work on the sculpture campaign that we saw at the beginning. So now to conclude, I want to highlight some ideas that I want you to, to retain about this. These campaigns, they matter because they are incubators of collective action, or as in the case of the Walls Remember Their Faces, they are collective actions per se. In a more general manner, these campaigns have acted as what French sociologist Christophe Crény calls, and I quote him, devices for political awareness. In this case, by using public space, provoking the participation of the public, and in, the, in Trainy's words, quote, causing or inciting effective reactions that foster and extend the debate about subjects worth of moral and political concern, end of quote. They have done so by transforming the aesthetics of public spaces by bringing artistic expression to the streets. So, for example, here we have a, a map in progress. These are some of the points in the city where you can find um, some of these works. And in a country without museums dedicated to modern or contemporary art, these walls have served to create new exhibition spaces, questioning also the way in which art is experienced in Yemen. They have also engaged a large number of participants uh, in a varied public that has joined these campaigns in, through painting the walls. Namely, in the case of the first two campaigns, so color the walls of your street, vale, ya termino. And the walls remember their faces, and probably as a reflection of the deterioration of the political situation, engaging less participants in a political committed um, projects during the last two campaigns. Finally, the campaigns have served as a device to obtain recognition and visibility. Murad has self-financed all of his works refusing to accept any money in order to maintain this project independent. While doing so, he attracted a great attention from local and international media, making a name for himself and participating to the visibility of this practice in Yemen and abroad. This visibility should be studied aside, but I will end uh, now by stressing that it represents a possibility <coughs> to focus on what Yemenis are building and creating, of course, in a fragile and changing context. Thank you. Our last uh, uh, intervention will take us to Morocco. Um, Morocco, uh, which is one of the countries that has not really seen a change of the regime out of the uh, Arab Springs, although there were uh, changes on the constitution and, 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 and other uh, uh, transformations, but not really a change of the regime. But it's been also witnessing um, uh, an important uh, movement uh, uh, around the so-called 20th of February movement with many uh, students involved on that, but also turn into many creative kind of action. Um, and Juat Sunani uh, is joining us here today to uh, let us know uh, about uh, some of these uh, actions. He himself is the director, uh, currently he's the director and playwright uh, and artistic direc director of Deba, Dabas Theatre Company, uh, which is in Rabat, and is one of these uh, uh, local entities that has act as a, uh, as, as a focus of uh, an, an a gathering point for many of those that were really uh, trying to uh, uh, show in public and be active. Uh, when trying to transform uh, into a more uh, um, justice, uh, 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 just society and uh, to, to, to make their claims visible and, and public. And um, Jawad has been running the, the, the Bad Theatre Company 
Uh, since many years already, he's, uh, he's by, by degree, he's a lawyer. He obtained his uh, degree in FES, but he rapidly turned into theater. And he's been involved in theater since uh, since many years ago. He's been uh, been uh, he's been doing a residency in London. He he got uh, an award also um, uh, in his country by one of his last uh, uh, plays. And uh, basically, his uh, his theater is known by uh, many people. Says that is like the theater of engagement. No. I don't know if you like uh, this term or not. Maybe you, uh, I, I, I know that you are not very uh, happy about the uh, uh, description, but is the way many people see uh, the, the work you do because of the commitment, permanent commitment to citizenship and social issues that you show with the place that you put in place and also the action, the social action that moves around the theater. So let us know, uh, Jawad, uh, which is the activity that you run in the theater and where we are again, this question, where we are now uh, after this uh, uh, st the starting of the movement, uh, the Arab Spring, the mm. so-called Arab Spring. Bon, euh, je vais essayer juste de répondre à ta question de, par rapport à cette appellation de théâtre engagé. Moi, j'ai étudié l'histoire de l'art, l'histoire du théâtre. Ça n'existe pas le mot théâtre engagé ou art engagé. Euh, par contre, ça peut être une sorte d'adjectif de, de, pour vous qualifier et ça fait plaisir de l'entendre de l'autre, mais jamais moi je vais dire que je suis engagé. Parce que je n'ai jamais entendu parler d'un médecin engagé ou d'un euh, menuisier engagé. Je crois que l'engagement, c'est quelque chose d'éthique qu'on a en soi, que quand on veut exceller, faire bien son travail, on est engagé. Un cordonnier peut être quelqu'un d'engagé. Et je ne sais pas pourquoi on colle à chaque fois aux poètes, aux artistes, dès qu'ils commencent à se soucier, à être très, très impliqués dans les, les affaires de, de la cité, de leur étiqueter par un faux compliment de « engagé ». Moi, je ne le considère pas comme, comme un compliment. Ça, ça fait peut-être aussi pour certains euh, quelque chose de marketing, de dire « je suis un artiste engagé euh, », mais c'est juste quelque chose que je refute. Je ne veux pas tomber dans ce dans ce, problème, ce, ce, ce piège de, de marketing de, de ce qu'on fait. Je, tout ce que je fais, c'est ma passion et j'ai la chance que grâce à cette passion, euh, j'en ai fait un métier et, et, et je suis très chanceux. C'est quelque chose que j'ai choisi, que personne n'a choisi pour moi, ni ma famille, ni euh, mon entourage. C'est mon métier et ma passion. Euh, je suis censé parler, euh, pour respecter le, le titre de, de mon intervention, de, de travail de la mémoire collective. Le travail sur la mémoire collective, ce n'est pas euh, le, tout ce qu'on fait, c'est une partie de notre travail à Daba Théâtre. Euh, alors, je, je vais rendre juste un hommage parce qu'il y, y a un signe très, très fort que j'ai reçu de plus ce matin en accédant ici euh, une des personnes remarquables que j'ai rencontrées dans ma vie. Euh, qui est décédé et affiché la, à l'affiche, c'est Sotigué Koyate. Et c'est vraiment un signe parce que je, je pensais à lui euh, la nuit dernière par rapport à ce travail de mémoire. Pas, si vous avez remarqué l'affiche à l'entrée, le, le, le cycle de cinéma, il y, a, il y a monsieur africain, malien, assis à côté d'une femme. C'est un de mes maîtres qui est décédé il y a quelques années, que je n'ai pas pu aller à son enterrement parce qu'il y avait le volcan en Islande et je n'ai pas pu prendre... La vie, c'est quelqu'un qui m'a beaucoup, beaucoup, beaucoup apporté. Et, et du coup, j'ai tout réimprovisé pour être aussi fidèle à sa mémoire, puisqu'il s'agit de mémoire. Soti Gema et, et d'autres, comme Brooke, comme Pina Bausch, comme, comme d'autres que, que j'ai rencontrés par le voyage, par le livre, par l'audio. Et après, quand j'ai pu voyager, j'ai pu rencontrer physiquement et les voir de, de, de tout près. Euh, Soti m'a appris d'agir au lieu de réagir, d'écouter, au lieu d'entendre, d'échanger, au lieu de répondre, de toucher, au lieu de parler, de sentir, au lieu de voir. Étant le fondateur de Daba Théâtre, tout ce que je viens de dire là comme réflexion, ce n'est pas quelque chose que j'ai inventé, c'est quelque chose qu'on m'a transmis. Le mot transmettre est très important pour moi et pour Daba Théâtre. Je suis l'accoucheur de ce Daba Théâtre. Du coup, c'est un ego qui a retrouvé d'autres égos qui forment le collectif. 
C'est pour ça, ce n'est pas, pas de la prétention, mais c'est juste j'ai appelé des gens, je les ai invités et on a fait ensemble ce projet. Daba veut dire « now »,« maintenant ». Sauf que c'est un « maintenant » vital. Euh, on a comme slogan ce mot-là « action citoyenne, culturelle, artistique, libre » à quel qui, par coïncidence, en berbère, nous, on, on préfère dire amazir, vous, vous dites berbère, veut dire la terre. Euh, désolé de parler après les économistes et tout, moi, je vais parler en, en symbolique, aux choses, peut-être des choses moins concrètes, mais en tout cas, qui sont notre capital. Euh, on a produit cette charte qui est très importante pour nous. Ce n'est pas pour formater les gens, pour leur dire c'est la Bible, mais non, cette charte est juste un cadre dans lequel on a une vision. On ne veut pas être étiqueté que juste de poètes ou d'artistes rêveurs qui vont dire le tout, n'importe quoi, mais on veut donner un sens politique au poétique. Politique dans, dans le vrai sens noble du terme. Pas le politique politicien, mais vraiment toute la question qu'on fait est autour de ça, du politico-poétique. C'est ce qui étiquette l'engagement. Le, le, Alors, le nom d'Abba Théâtre, euh, par rapport à notre charte, c'est que et s'écrit toujours en majuscule, c'est parce qu'on est dans un pays où les gens, quand ils parlent, ils disent « Anna wa a'udu billah min qawlat anna »« Anna, moi, et que Dieu me préserve de mon moi. » Or, il faut être fou pour, pour maudire son moi, son ego, parce qu'on est avec notre ego. Et je crois qu'une des raisons qu pour laquelle on écrit le dabatet majuscule, c'est parce que c'est contextuel par rapport à la société dans laquelle on est qui, qui se met toujours en minuscule, c'est juste pour aussi donner un symbole de dignité. Ce n'est pas un symbole de prétention. De prétention. Et euh, comme je viens d'expliquer, le daba euh, bah, veut dire le, le now, le, le maintenant. Euh, on a aussi choisi une manière de comment on, on écrit notre slogan. Je vais expliquer pourquoi ça. C'est parce que aussi signifie le passage. C'est qu'on est de trois points de côté, trois points de l'autre. C'est juste que cette vie, c'est juste un passage. On conventionne cet endroit, mais demain, on n'est plus là. Hier, on n'était pas non plus. Du coup, c'est juste en convention de cet, cet espace-là, très important, aussi espace temporel aussi, de, de vraies écoutes, de vraies rencontres et, et de bonne foi. Euh, nous avons aussi choisi une, une couleur officielle, c'est l'orange. Et euh, l'orange, tout simplement parce que c'est une couleur qui, qui conjugue deux choses. Euh, un égo fort, parce qu'on met l'orange face à n'importe quelle autre couleur en dualité, euh, il est fort. Par contre, vous mettez l'orange dans le collectif, il est humble. C'est-à-dire que c'est chercher cette... cest personne ne, ne s'aperçoit souvent de, de la, que la couleur orange est très existante dans l'espace. Par contre, dès qu'on la met en, en contradiction, l'orange le, le, apparaît. Euh, nous avons un salut, je vais vous le mettre. Tous les artistes saluent avec, comme ça ou comme ça. Nous, parce qu'on est dans un système un peu injuste, et pour la dignité, on a choisi ce salut. Jamais on ne salue en se prosternant. Parce que, inspiré de notre mémoire azul, les berbères, à Mazir, pour dire salam ou salut, disent azul. La signification d'azul, c'est proche de mon cœur. Et. Tout ça est important pour dire que on est contemporain. Mais si on n'est on, on on pas très, très à l'aise avec notre histoire, on ne peut pas créer de mémoire. Après, je vais parler, c'est quoi la nuance entre histoire et mémoire, en tout cas pour notre vision. Et puis, il y a le slogan, cette action citoyenne, culturel, artistique libre. Je vais juste la lire ce passage. Notre action est vaine sans citoyenneté. Notre citoyenneté est vaine sans culture. Notre culture est vaine sans art. Notre art est vain sans liberté. La liberté mérite toute notre action. Comment ça, c'est de la philosophie, c'est de la symbolique. Comment alors on va concrétiser ça pour dire que la mémoire n'est pas for forcément une sorte de folklorisation du passé. On peut demander à n'importe qui dans la rue ou poser le, une question sur le mot mémoire, 
tout de suite, on va penser à ce qui a existé avant. Et parfois même, à la mémoire, par exemple, le discours officiel au Maroc, pour parler de mémoire, tout de suite, on va sortir le tapis berbère, les hommes ont le djellaba, les, euh, des, histoires, des, des, des photos en noir et blanc des années, des années 20, des années 30. Mais personne ne pense que, que la mémoire vient en nous. On est la mémoire aussi. On est porteur de mémoire. Il y a, il y a, il y a une grande différence. C'est pour ça qu'on a cherché toujours à être contemporain, mais aussi, pareil, ce mot contemporain, parfois, est, très, est, 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 est un piège. Parce que ça veut dire être dans l'extrême... Euh, C'est plutôt de la technologie, de les avancer. Alors que que, que parfois on se pose la question, est-ce que Tawhidi ou le Jahed, ou pour parler euh, culture ici, euh, Saint-Augustin, ne sont pas plus contemporains que nous, voire modernes, plus modernes que nous. Alors on a re-questionné aussi cette question de contemporanité. Est-ce qu'il est matériel parce que la personne physique n'existe plus, parce que contemporain c'est faire partie de son temps, ou il est immatériel Est-ce que Brecht, est-ce que Saint-Augustin, est-ce que Tawhidi, est-ce qu'il a cessé de d'exister de, parmi nous. Et du coup, ça ne fait pas de lui quelqu'un de contemporain. Ça, c'est des questions que nous nous sommes posées pour, par rapport, par rapport à, à notre démarche. Je vais aller, essayer d'aller plus vite. Je suis quand même un petit peu ému par l'histoire de la photo. Euh, dès notre, la création de cette compagnie, nous avons attaqué par la première question, c'est l'adaptation d'une pièce de Ariel Dorfman, je ne je sais pas si vous la connaissez, ça s'appelle euh, « La jeune fille, la mort », en anglais c'est « The Dead and the Maiden euh, ». Ça, ça parle de la période Pinochet et la transition démocratique au Chili. Quel rapport Chili-Maroc Tout simplement, c'était une réadaptation pour le contexte d'après Hassan II au Maroc. Après Hassan II au Maroc, il y a eu une sorte d'instance d'équité et réconciliation pour un peu faire un peu l'éloge au nouveau règne, au nouveau système, mais aussi pour aussi rompre avec un certain passé douloureux. Le 15 décembre 2004, le jour de la première audition, nous avons aussi lancé notre première création réadaptée et qui interroge les Marocains sur leur capacité de pardonner, leur capacité de réinterroger leur passé, leur capacité de faire revivre, faire revivre leur mémoire. Nous avons ensuite engagé un long programme qui s'appelle le Dabatia de citoyens par, des, par un, un, un programme d'écriture ensemble avec les citoyens dans lequel les citoyens viennent euh, un peu faire un exercice de, 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 de mémoire petit M pour réécrire la mémoire grand M. Euh, N'importe qui pouvait venir raconter euh, une histoire par rapport à, à, à quelque chose de, 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 qui est arrivé à lui ou bien à sa famille ou quelqu'un qu'il connaît dans le présent ou dans le passé, et on met à disposition un ensemble de dramaturges, de metteurs en scène, qui vont retravailler cette histoire. Et, et ça a fait un programme régulier qui, qui, qui a duré pendant cinq ans, qui s'est arrêté il y a deux ans, parce qu'il a été remplacé par un autre programme dont je n'ai pas le temps de vous en parler encore plus. Mais en tout cas, c'est un programme très interactif dans lequel il y avait chaque mois trois semaines de travail qui aboutissent à la quatrième semaine. C'est une semaine de, de présentation. Ce qui a fait que Ensuite, on est allé vers les écoles pour leur, euh, pour leur proposer des partenariats où nos artistes en fait, partent pour travailler avec le jeune public surtout, mais aussi parfois avec des universités où les artistes qu'on voit souvent, certains artistes sont devenus maintenant, même avant, étaient stars, ils leur proposent juste de venir et de travailler avec les, avec les élèves, les étudiants, euh, enfants, ados ou même voire adultes, sur des choses qui, qui leur appartiennent à eux parfois même travaille sur un objet, quelqu'un qui a hérité d'une montre de, de son grand-père ou quelqu'un qui, 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 qui a hérité de, 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 de chien de son voisin et il veut en faire un sujet politique. On n'a pas besoin de grandes histoires pour créer de la politique. Mais le plus important, c'est vraiment de faire sortir les gens, que les gens parlent, parce qu'après 40 ans de, où les gens se taisent, on ne peut pas leur demander de tout de suite parler de grandes choses bien pensantes. Ils peuvent aussi raconter leurs petites histoires de leurs petites poupées qui, qui étaient cassées. Et en leur demandant de faire ça, on a appris quelque chose d'extraordinaire. Et je fais vite pour arriver à, à vous montrer un, un, un petit documentaire euh, vidéo. Et en parlant en fait, de ça, on a appris quelque chose d'énorme sur nous, qu'on ne pourra jamais être dans la mémoire. 
Et la mémoire telle que nous la voulons, une mémoire vivante, pas une mémoire postcard, carte postale, mais une mémoire vraiment vivante. On ne pourra jamais être dans une vraie interrogation aussi d'un autre chantier, celui de l'identité. L'identité est plurielle. L'identité n'est pas passée si on n'a pas euh, fait quelque chose d'extraordinaire. Et c'est le mot que je, veux rem... que, je... que je veux vraiment mettre encore en valeur, la transmission, avec un grand T. La transmission, ce qui nous apprend ça, nos sat pour, en fait, euh, merci d'avoir parlé de ça tout à l'heure, euh, mon ami libanais. Euh, il nous apprend d'être dans le pour. Beaucoup de gens, au quotidien, se battent contre les injustices, se battent contre euh, l'oppression. Mais on oublie que juste en changeant un petit peu d'angle, parce que l'injustice sera là, ad vitam aeternam. Toute la vie, il y aura de l'injustice. Je suis réaliste par rapport à ça. Mais on peut rendre la vie meilleure si on se bat pour la justice, pour des valeurs. Ça, ça paraît très nuancé, mais, mais en tout cas pour nous, c'est quelque chose de très important comme philosophie de, de pratique. C'est pour ça qu'on a le « pour une démarche artistique différente et non indifférente, une démarche citoyenne et non citadine, pour une démarche qui nous rassemble au lieu ou plus qu'elle nous ressemble, pour un art populaire et non populiste, pour un art humble et non modeste, pour un art intelligible et non intellectuel, sensible et non sensuel, pour une conjugaison singulière au pluriel et non pluriel au singulier. C'est notre le pour du quoi d'abord être. Euh, on a lancé depuis du coup depuis quatre ans, on a lancé un grand chantier, celui de toucher chaque chaque semaine, régulièrement toute l'année. 20 structures dans un, entre trois villes, 20 structures par semaine. C'est-à-dire nos artistes, ils ne sont pas que dans la création, ils ne sont pas dans l'expérimentation, ils sont aussi dans la transmission. Transmission, euh, on a choisi transmission pour ne pas dire éduquer ou former, parce que éduquer, c'est quelque chose un peu de supériorité, et former, c'est un peu formatage. Et du coup, le mot transmettre nous semble le plus, le plus adéquat pour notre manière de comment comment garder cette mémoire en vie. Euh, je, je finis par ça et je, je passe juste tout de suite à la vidéo. Ça, c'est la troisième édition. Et en fait, je vous laisse avec ça parce que le résultat de tout ça, c'est tous les gamins des 20 structures qui viennent parler et faire vivre leur propre mémoire par un festival qu'ils qu organisent eux-mêmes et que nous encadrons. Six. La vision par rapport au festival est juste très très simple, c'est de rappeler aussi en fait, puisque Malheureusement, la l'État ne le fait pas. Rappeler déjà les basiques d'un festival. Normalement, c'est quelque chose qui se construit sur l'année. C'est un couronnement. Euh, Daba Théâtre, c'est une compagnie euh, de théâtre qui a été créée, ça fait plus que dix ans. Et dedans, en fait, il y a plus, plusieurs créations, il y a des créations artistiques, danse, théâtre, musique, des performances qui, voilà, qui mélangent de tout, un peu de tout. Et le festival de Rosos, c'est un festival qui a commencé ça fait deux ans avec certaines écoles ici à Rabat et à Salé. Son, comment, son but, c'est créer un peu d'éducation artistique, théâtrale, dans des écoles. On est convaincu qu'un enfant qui a l'accès à la culture, à la créativité, que 
aussi les, euh, il y a un effet positif pour son développement personnel. On a commencé le 12 décembre, on a fait 6 jours, on a fait un peu de temps, on a fait un peu de temps, on a fait un peu de temps, on a fait un peu de temps. كندير ميديتاسيون كل حصه كنبداو ب 4 دقائق ديال الصمت وكيعجبهم Parmi les objectifs du festival aussi, c'est pour DB Théâtre, c'est de mettre en valeur le, le volet transmission de la compagnie. En fait, il fallait quand même euh, mettre face à soi-même un peu l'histoire de, de, de la pratique artistique au Maroc. Et on se rend compte très rapidement que ce qui manquait au Maroc, ce qu'on essaie de nous un peu de remplir, c'est cette transmission spatio-temporelle, c'est cette transmission dans l'espace ou transmission générationnelle dans le temps. La transmission n'est pas faite exclusivement pour les enfants, mais elle a été aussi faite pour les enseignants pour garder, comme je vous ai dit, cette continuité, cette pérennité de ce projet. Et heureusement, les enseignants étaient, euh, étaient ravis de, de recevoir ces informations, de recevoir cette, cette, cette manière de faire avec les enfants. Euh, à l'époque, j'étais étudiant. Et euh, la confrontation avec les, les, les élèves, les enfants, c'était vraiment génial. Euh, je vais étudier dans les écoles avant de me former à quelque chose. Je vais initier un projet presque, le projet de Rosos, les ateliers de Rosos, avec ma propre compagnie. Il y a un projet de Rosos, 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 صراحة كنت خلقين بزاف في الأول كنا في الأول مكناش كانت يقف بعطياتنا كنا كل واحد كيقول أنا الرأسي أنا هذه من بعد بوسرة اللي خلتنا نتقف بعطياتنا ولنا كنا نعود وشي شي حوايز اللي مكنا نعود ومش العائلة ديالنا شو سي أبخيك C'est pas très important de toujours rester genre toute seule et tout. Je me suis fait aussi de nouveaux amis. On était dans la même école, mais on ne se parlait pas. J'ai appris à les connaître, ils sont aussi très sympas. Je suis très sympa. 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 البوليس كنشوف فيها عادي وجاو كنتربوا على واحد المسرحية اللي هي ممتعة في نفس الوقت كت كتبين بأن التلاميذ قادين دي واحد الحاجة اللي الكبار تعوم كذا